so my dad plays the accordion <laughs> and I grew up on, well, my dad's always had multiple bands. So when I was hanging out with my dad growing up, he either had like his polka band or he had his rock band and, you know, and I grew up doing that. So I grew up on like polkas, waltzes, classic rock. But then when I was in high school, I joined, you know, jazz band. And then I started doing private instruction um, with the teacher at UW-Whitewater. Um, and he got me into jazz in Cuban. And then he, he had studied overseas for several years. So then I got into, you know, Cuban music and Latin music. And then I went to school at UW-Whitewater for percussion performance. Um, so I got my uh, degree in that um, at Whitewater. But when I was there, I did you know, all jazz and Cuban, but then I met a guy who got me into dream theater and into metal. And then I went into the metal world and I got, uh, we were a progressive metal band, uh, cause we were all studying music at UW Whitewater. So we were a progressive metal band and then I got into metal. And then after that band, it just kind of went in. I've literally just dabbled in everything now, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun being very, diverse in the music world but i still play with my dad some days i'm playing polkas some days i'm playing classic rock and then my band were like alternative rock um and then sometimes i help in like a 90s rock band and you know in my background i just love metal so for me you know when i'm practicing i like my metal so i've kind of dabbled in it all <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Old Music Matters in that podcast. I'm your host, Brian. Enjoy me today. How do you pronounce your last name? Zach Swifel? Just Swifel. Yeah, Zach Swifel. Swifel. Okay, nice to meet you. Uh, where are you hailing from, brother? I'm sorry, what was that? I was going to say, uh, what state are you in? Are you, do you live in the States or do you live overseas? I'm in the States. I'm over in Wisconsin. Oh, you're one of the people out there. Are you close to Green Bay by any chance or Milwaukee? It's about um, closer to Milwaukee. Green Bay is almost three and a half hours away from me. Oh, really? I guess you're a big Milwaukee Brewers fan. I am not. I'm uh, I'm a Chicago Cubs guy. Oh, really? <laughs> that's kind of on. <laughs> actually from Chicago. Oh, so, that's where you're from. Yeah, originally, and now we're we're in Wisconsin, and uh, we still uh, we still like the Cubs better. <laughs> uh, well, I guess you do have one thing to be proud of too, because did they win the World Series in 2016? Yeah, yeah. After a, a long, long, long drought. <laughs> oh my gosh! And a long drought ahead. I would say I do remember listening to like the documentary about it too. And that was when they played the Marlins. I think it was 2001, I believe, or 2002. It was one of those years when the fan tried to catch that foul ball, and he interfered with trying to catch it too. So, I mean, that was pretty sad too. And he also felt bad for the guy afterwards because the fans really tried to rip him too. Yep. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> But nonetheless, congratulations to you. It's good to see your curse is done, but I'm from Pittsburgh, so I guess now it's our curse to kind of take on, I guess. Or uh, Yeah, the Pittsburgh curse. Yeah, everyone uh, got close. <laughs> Actually, the Cubs did sweep them recently, so I got to give you guys credit for that, too. So, <laughs> ah, well, live and learn. We'll, we'll see what happens. All right. All right. So, Zach, welcome to my podcast right here. Uh, the way my podcast works is we just like to get to know people – both as the individual, but also as the drummer, too. So I'm just going to ask you some simple questions right here. Ready to roll? All right. All right. So we'll start with the first one right here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you become a drummer? Uh, I've actually literally drummed my entire life. My dad just celebrated 71 years this month. Um, I actually just turned 40 on Wednesday. And uh, my dad has had a band since he was 13, so... Even before I was out of the womb, my mom said she could feel me kicking along to all the music as my, you know, dad was playing at the, wherever he was. And as soon as I came out, I was smacking pots and pans and I got a drum set at four years old and, and that was it. And I even had a toy drum set before my real drum set. And, and now 30, you know, 36 years later, I'm still playing drums. Yeah, she used to, uh, I, I'd take like all the lids and flip them upside down like cymbals and hit all the pans on the 
on the floor, she said. And, uh, you know, that's when they're like, yep, okay, we'll just get you a drum set. So you stop ruining all of mom's uh, pots and pans. <laughs> that's good to hear. And uh, first off, congratulations to your dad, too. And uh, also congratulations on your amount of years, I guess, also as a drum teacher. And uh, I guess what else do you do for a living? For, for a living, I'm actually, it's really exciting stuff. I'm a product specialist for a, a composite deck line. I just do sales uh, for decking, but then um, I teach both private, privately and publicly through one of the music stores, and then here in my in my basement. Uh, I see. So you're one of those people that have to work multiple jobs in order to meet ends meet because I've been kind of the same way too. But my main profession is not in music. This is pretty much meant to be somewhat. Hopefully, we're building towards a paying career if we want to say it that way. But. <laughs> But it's something we do enjoy for the most part, too. But I do have to ask, uh, do you know Eric Fjordstein by any chance? Because he lives in Chicago as well. Can't say it's ringing any bells. Hmm. That's fine. I want to say, like, small world because he has lived in Chicago, too, and he's a real cool dude. And uh, hmm. I don't know if by any chance you guys have met each other by either accident or at some maybe sort of music convention or anything like that, too. So shout out no, to Eric, by no. the way. So, But I guess... Uh, was that also your dad who kind of got you into like the blues and uh, classic rock? Or I guess uh, was it just something you just picked up on your own? So my dad plays the accordion. <laughs> and I grew up on, well, my dad's always had multiple bands. So when I was hanging out with my dad growing up, he either had like his polka band or he had his rock band. And, you know, and I grew up doing that. So I grew up on like polkas, waltzes, classic rock. But then when I was in high school, I joined, you know, jazz band. And then I started doing private instruction um, with the teacher at UW-Whitewater. Um, and he got me into jazz in Cuban. And then he, he had studied overseas for several years. So then I got into, you know, Cuban music and Latin music. And then I went to school at UW-Whitewater for percussion performance. Um, so I got my uh, degree in that um, at whitewater but when i was there i did you know all jazz and cuban but then i met a guy who got me into dream theater and into metal and then i went into the metal world and i got uh we were a progressive metal band because uh, we were all studying music at uw whitewater so we were a progressive metal band and then i got into metal and then after that band it just kind of went in i've literally just dabbled in everything now you know, it's it's a lot of fun being very diverse in the music world. But I still play with my dad. Some days I'm playing polkas. Some days I'm playing classic rock. And then my band were like alternative rock. Um, and then sometimes I help in like a 90s rock band. And, you know, in my background, I just love metal. So for me, you know, when I'm practicing, I like my metal. So I've kind of dabbled in it all. <laughs> I know that's how drummers like to roll too, when they incorporate all those different genres together into their play style. Is that what you sort of do in your teaching, but also in your play style? Yeah, I try I try to do that too, especially with all my students, is to open their eyes to more than just what they think they know, because it's so, so little. And then teach things that'll really help kind of, if they went out and played with anybody and, you know, use what could really go around, you know, to help with any kind of situation that they might get into hmm. and i guess when you got into metal was it more of the sort of dream fear sort of music too or did you kind of go into the more heavier like death metal and dark metal <laughs> or black metal I, whatever i got to a certain point where i was like my metal my metal focus my metal listening is heavier than my metal playing because some of those guys are just mind bending and you know the hours that they spend doing you know heel toe or swivel technique and it's just insane and um so i listened to some pretty heavy stuff but um my playing to the heavy stuff is not the same it's uh you know it's it's not where i'd want it to be but i don't really want to spend the time to get it where it needs to be <laughs> you know i've got to say way too i'm just listening to some of those guys who do like the gravity blast because they're doing like the high 200s to bpms to maybe 300 and you're like yeah right i mean that's like trying to do like drum rolls with just one hand the whole time and then like yeah 
You yeah, I know my much. exact limit in beats per minute for 16th notes on my double bass, and I'm nowhere close to those guys. You know, you, you start hitting the 200, and the, I'll get up to like 210s, 216, and I'm toasted. These guys are hitting 250s, 260s, and I'm like, that's not even, I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> Years of experience, for one thing, but also, uh, I would say, too, it does make for a nice workout, too, if you're, yeah. so, yeah. kind of beats doing the cardio on the treadmill for X amount of minutes. <laughs> Or, yeah, or, or getting right my mind in with a minute of practice. True. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I noticed you're probably in the in your man cave, considering all the drums you have around you too. So I guess which one do you kind of play with? And I guess if you want to walk through each one, I guess how many you got all together? I'm uh, I'm currently at twelve drum sets. I think I have left. I sold a couple. My wife has been on me about lowering my collection, so I've sold a couple but i have um my absolute favorite is in the very back that's my yamaha maple custom i've been collecting it for years um it's got four bass drums four snare drums and almost every time i can get my hands on 8 10 12 13 14 15 and 16 so if anyone's got that rare 18 floor tom unicorn out there you let me know in the vintage <laughs> and i and i'm in it doesn't matter um this one here is absolutely, um, this is my baby gift to myself. Um, this is my pork pie zebra wood rosewood. When uh, we were having our first daughter, I was uh, trying out for this other band and I really wanted a new kit and I called up Bill because I absolutely love this finish. And uh, now I have a nine piece pork pie kit, which my favorite thing though is in the snare drum. He actually signed it to my daughter so he said, welcome, Harper Pearl Ann, uh, sweet to the to the world, which is really awesome. Uh, and then I've got like my current PDP classic concept maple kit. I actually own two. I own the matching bop kit, which I play out with my dad's band. Uh, I've got three other PDP kits and D-drum kits and a uh, couple of sonars. My first kit was a sonar. It's a practice kit now. It's just, it's crazy. I don't know. I have an obsession. Oh, and you probably notice I have, I think I'm at 83 snare drums right now. <laughs> so that's that's my addiction. <laughs> Actually, I would say your collection kind of rivals with uh, Dustin Failer, I guess. Uh, do you know that drummer out of Arizona? I do. I actually, uh, I know the name. Yeah, he, I remember I interviewed him and his whole collection pretty much, it covered all four walls to say the least. So, I mean... <laughs> I mean, you got some competition in the match up there, so good luck to you if you want to try to match that. So, uh, I would say the one, the one I'm seeing on my left, I guess you're right. That looks more like a hybrid set. Is that strictly an acoustic set too? All acoustic. Yep. All all of the kits that I have are acoustic. I do use um, live. The closest I use is the Roland Octopad, but all of my kits are um, exclusively acoustic kits. I guess outside of that, have you tried to experiment with like? how rolling kits are too, those electric pads and everything too, just maybe calm the noise down too. I'm hoping the wife doesn't say anything about that. So, Well, my um, my very first drum set is my sonar kit, which is in the other room uh, next door, and it has all the mesh drum heads, and then it has all the silent stroke um, symbols, all the L80 symbols on there. So it keeps it very quiet. And then I don't use the bass drum because I kept breaking the bass drum head. So it's just got one of the uh, bass room practice pads for the bass drum. But it's set up like a full-size kit, but it's uh, it's very quiet. So my daughters can sleep, and I can still play. <laughs> I guess you're one of those like all-nighters who want to just play all night, that sort of thing? There's uh, That's about the only time I get the chance to play, is at night. <laughs> mm, I see, too. And I guess, do you do any sort of drum covers? Do you have like a YouTube channel or anything? Yeah, I've got my YouTube channel. Uh, I think I'm up to like 63 drum covers right now. I basically started it uh, when COVID hit and uh, I've been going since then. And uh, I just recently, actually I just posted uh, a Caroline Spine, Sullivan was my latest drum cover that I just did, but uh, I've got a diverse range of songs in there. I see. I, I was kind of the same way too, because I started my YouTube channel during COVID as well. And I remember actually using the iRig because I've always rolled the electric drum sets and, uh, Actually, I remember doing it on a different iPhone. It wasn't like this one. And so 
the picture doesn't look the greatest. It was kind of really compact and everything, but I mean, I just said, screw it. I pretty much wasted a good amount of time just trying to get this whole thing down, so I'm just going with it. And uh, I guess before I we do... Ju- I'm oh, sorry, you hear that? I was going to say, before we jump into COVID, I guess, can you just elaborate what you hope to achieve with your YouTube channel? Then if you want to mention what you were going to say, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I basically... So when COVID hit, it kind of destroyed my band, actually. The band that I was currently in, it just fell apart. No one was hiring anymore. It couldn't play anywhere. Um, one of the guys was extremely, um, you know, cautious about the whole thing, which I get, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say anything against it. Um, and then, so we just didn't keep it together. It just kind of, you know, fell apart. And then I got so bored. I was like, what are we doing? Uh, I, there's nothing that I can do. I'm just bored at home. So, I said, screw it. I'm going to try to do some drum covers. And I, you know, my first two or three were out of cell phone or actually they were out of my uh, camera, my Nikon camera that I had from going to car shows. I used to take car photos. And uh, so I did it all out of the uh, audio, out of the, you know, out of the phone, which was not the best. And then after the first couple got some, you know, decent attention, I was like, well, I guess I'll call up one of my reps over at the music store. And and then I bought all the equipment that I needed, but I didn't go too, too fancy because I didn't know how it would go for me. And I've never tried it. And it's 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 a learning curve. Let's just say that it's a learning curve trying to figure it all out and and the, the different processes and the crazy parts. It's like you try to go online and see what to do, but everyone does everything different. And, you know, what works best for you and, you know, who's whose process are you going to follow? You know, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a hump, but I feel like I've been doing pretty well um, with it. And, uh, you know, my editing is getting better and both audio and visually. So and I'm enjoying it. So it's been great. Yeah. And you know, that that's kind of always with me too. Cause you're thinking like, I'll just do drum covers and we'll see like how many views we can probably get out of it too. And you're thinking like, Nope, that's not how it works. So you have to, that's why you have to be different or differentiate. For yeah. Them. Yeah. And I've done, you know, I've done other things like symbol reviews and, you know, I just, re- I just posted one about a new stand that I just bought for a uh, recording. Um, I've done a couple on like setting up your drum set. And, and those are the ones that, you know, if you want to have a successful YouTube channel, uh, you know, you got to go for it. Cause if you just do music covers, you can't do anything cause everything's copywritten anyways. You can't, uh, you can't do that. So um, I, I do throw in other videos to, you know, and uh, to try to make the channel. And that's not my, it's not like it's my goal is to be a YouTube content creator, but I just enjoy doing it. It keeps me busy. Yeah, I can see why too. And, you, you know, you try to have fun with it too, but then there's a point where if it does become an obsession, that's when it also becomes part of the business then. So yeah, that's for sure. I was say you almost feel like you're getting to that point where you're trying to at least keep it fun or and as a hobby. It, it, it is. It is that I'm at that point where it's still a lot of fun. Um, and then I've got like a million ideas running around. It's just trying to find the time to put them into a video and get the editing. And um, the hardest part, the part that's not fun, <laughs> is trying to be consistent. Like, okay, every week I got to throw a video out there or try to, you know, stay consistent. And that part is the harder part, but I've just got a million ideas. And so it's still fun for me right now to just put these videos together and, and get them out there and, and hope that, I, I guess in the end, my, my goal is just to help other people. I've always been a big fan of DIY stuff. Um, a lot of people in the car world know me as a DIYer because I built this race car and, and made a couple magazines with it. And um, I used to do all these DIYs, but now... Um, people don't want forums anymore. They, you know, do things like TikTok and YouTube. So uh, I just hope that it helps somebody with a video. And as long as I helped one person, then I feel like that video is a success. I guess also given your real job, I guess, would you try to maybe do videos about DIY, maybe your own patio porch or something like that? Or I don't, um, I don't deal on the uh, the actual, I don't know. I'm more on, we're the wholesaler, so I'm the very, very beginning of the food chain. You know, I don't do a lot with the installation or the contractors themselves. So 
it never really goes, and, th- and that part doesn't really interest me. I would love to be able to uh, walk away from my job and do this full time. I wouldn't mind that at all. I just know that it would definitely be a lot of work and a full time. I'd probably work more hours doing this. <laughs> yeah, I guess you and me both. And uh, I guess the reason why I brought it up first, because I think sometimes, I don't know if you're in a big company or whether it was like one of those small entrepreneurial companies. So I thought maybe it was like, you're doing multiple jobs. You're the salesman, but then you're also helping with installation and everything else. So I wasn't sure if that was how your job went too. So, no, we're a worldwide, multi-billion-dollar big company. Thank goodness, it's a, it's a great company to work for. I absolutely love it. And you know, I do meet all the contractors. We do contractor events and everything else, but I don't get my hands uh, dirty, which is nice. Mm. All right, fair enough too. But best of luck on your YouTube channel. And I guess uh, what's your YouTube name under? It's just under Zach Sweefel. I don't really have anything cool. This is Zach Sweefel. <laughs> yeah, I did the same way too because I, I just feel like this is my face, this is my name, then this yeah. is the stuff I'm putting out here. So, right, take it or leave it, that sort of thing. All right, so best of luck with teammate. But uh, get into COVID too. Obviously, you said that your one band had crashed because unfortunately you weren't able to play in the venues, bars, or whatever. Yep. And I guess your band fell apart right there. So I guess did it? How bad did it impact you and your family? I guess. You know. Um, COVID is one of those subjects that, you know, it's easy to, you know, stir the pot. I, myself, um, I know that it affected a lot of people, but I, I think that as I think everyone went a little too far with it, in my opinion, and, and, and I get it and people were affected. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think looking back at some of the things and some of the rules and some of the, that's like our, were we really serious um, that this sheet of plastic was going to save everybody? And um, so it was kind of tough because I'm just such an outgoing person. I just, I can't just sit here. Like even like right now in this interview, like, you know, I I'm a fidgeter too. And that's why drums are great for me. I'm always moving and playing and I I just want to go out. I want to go explore things and go to different places and they're all closed now. And it's like, come on. I just, I can't be trapped inside and we trapped us inside and my mind just exploded inside, you know, a person like myself. So it it affected me in a different way mentally because I just couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't travel. I couldn't go visit friends and family and, you know, amusement parks or anything else. And, uh, you know, I, was, I still kind of look back and I'm like, God, what? none of this made sense, though. What, what, how are we serious about this? And uh, and it's crazy that it's still, you know, to the day. Um, the other night I went out to uh, a restaurant to celebrate my birthday and I didn't have a reservation. And apparently they've like cut back on all of their everything after COVID and has never gained back up to what they needed to be. And, and it was kind of weird. Like I've never been to a restaurant where they're like, Oh, you don't have a reservation. I don't know if we can fit yet. We'll try it. <laughs> like, Well, I'll just go to Buffalo Wild Wings right next door. If you want, does it bother me? No, no, no. Okay. We'll make it work. Okay. So I don't know. It hit me different because I just, I hate sitting inside. Well, I actually love sitting in this room, but I just, you know, I, I like going places and, doing things and uh you couldn't do it it was weird i was gonna say you have to sit down on a drum throne in order to play the drums you, i don't know too many you play it standing up unless you're a percussion player too so i um you'd be surprised if you ever watch me play live i do a lot of standing as i play too <laughs> well, i always thought that was more for the effect especially if you're like doing maybe one of those like breakdowns at the end of a song too where you just like in the symbols and go that sort of thing effect and sometimes it's just to give my butt a chance to breathe <laughs> sitting on that chair gets a little hot sometimes <laughs> i guess uh what uh brand is your drum throne um my favorite is uh i rock pork pie thrones they are so comfortable uh, i like the big the big old fat uh, pork pie thrones they're great um i prefer a tractor throne but most of all of mine are round i have to say i've been rolling with a rock and sock for a good while i guess have you ever had one of those I, I do. I have um, the the Yamaha setup actually has a hydraulic rock and sock. It's like the coolest thing ever. I uh, I need to bring that over here and set that up with one of the kits. It'd be a lot of fun. All right. That sounds cool. I'm sorry I kind of segue back into COVID, but I guess, did you have any brushes with it at all? Or, did you, or were you pretty lucky? No, we were. Um, everyone 
Um, and my entire immediate family was uh, very lucky. We got through with no issues. Uh, I don't actually recall any time that uh, the wife and I were ever sick. I, none of us ever tested positive either. Um, my wife's very, um, actually, she really loves it because she's a homebody, the opposite of me. And now her company has completely switched to, um, she works from home full time. And she absolutely loves it. So it worked out great for her. Um, I still was an essential worker, so I went to work. So I guess in that case, it, it helped the family because now my wife, you know, works from home. She likes being at home. Um, you know, she gets to see the daughters more and everything, which is great. It actually did help with, uh, did she have to work downtown at all? Because I was going to say it helped with not having to pay with parking and help save on gas too. So. Well, it did save on gas. Uh, I switched over to the little uh, plug-in thing because she doesn't drive anywhere. She drives like, you know, 10 miles a week, and it's to pick up our daughter from school next door. <laughs> I was going to say, is, oh, you got one of those uh, electric cars. Is it like a Tesla? No, no, and it's not an electric car. It's just that uh, she plugs in the thing to the ODP port so the insurance company can track how oh. many miles she drives. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lead foot. I'd never put one of those in my own vehicle. They would know that it would be very bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. But it's good to see you made it through COVID too, and uh, best luck going forward to you there, mate. So yeah, no, thanks. All right, so I guess get back into more of the drumming questions right here. I guess uh, what is it you love most about drumming? What do I love most about drumming? Yep. I I love the creativity and. Man, for me, like I said, I think a lot of it for me, man, that's, that is a good question. How would I word what I'm trying to say or think? I love the freedom behind the kit to express myself how I like to and, and all the fills. And, and I know a lot of drummers, there's a lot of debates when I talk to my students too and, and people on like, uh, actually even on my YouTube channel. There's a lot of drummers that are like, I have to play this note for note, perfect, perfect. And I, I don't do it that way. I, I will take fills that need to be played note for note, and I will play them how they need to be. But the rest of it, I like the freedom and of the ability to do as I need and, and have fun with it. Uh, versus like a guitarist, you know, they kind of have to, if you don't play the melody right, eh, everyone kind of knows. Um, but the drums, as long as I get close, I have a lot of fun with it, and, and I enjoy that a lot. Uh, I think um, for me, too, uh, it keeps my mind busy, like I said, so uh, that's great. And uh, I think the drummers always get a lot of attention, and I kind of like that. It makes you feel special uh, sitting behind that uh, big old drum set back there and and uh, wailing your arms around to the crowd. <laughs> Actually, some of the other things I kind of used and some of the things I picked up in the other interviews was it was a sense it was like therapy in a way. So I guess it kind of helped you out with COVID too. That's a, that's a huge one. I have um, I have a YouTube music uh, premium uh, and, and I love that. But I have like six different channels of totally different music from classical music to I have one channel called like One of Those Days and it's all like, you know sappy soft rock that just puts me in a different trance you know and then i've got you know like uh i've got a metal station and a classic rock station but all of them go with my different mood and you know depending on what mood i'm in is the music that i'm listening to and it's the same like all these kits like i don't play metal music you know on this kit it's not really that style of kit you know i play it on one of my other kits or but, uh, oh, that's definitely a big one it is the trance that it puts you in and the mood that it can set. Um, on sad days, I can play music that'll cheer me up. And on days where I'm just pissed off, well, I'm just glad I'm not a drum. I'm glad I'm not a drum because it takes a beating some days. <laughs> we abuse the hell out of the snare. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I had to get a kick out when you said one of those days because I immediately followed the Limbistic Limbiscuit song. It was a. Uh, it's just one of them days. It's just one of them days. <laughs> so. You know, and playing shows with my band now, you know, it's it's a great release. You know, you could have a bad week and then you go to play a show on the weekend 
And no matter how bad your week is, you watch the crowd responds to your, you know, your songs and it just feels so good inside. It's just, a, it's a release. It's a nice let go. Absolutely. So I was just trying to think of something else there too, but, uh, I would say going back earlier when you were talking about like saying, trying to play no for no and try to be this sort of perfectionist in a way, I, I unfortunately kind of suffered with that too, because I actually was playing songs from Silverstein, which is one of those alternative rock groups. Yep. And I always remember it too, because the song was called November and I was always struggling with more of the chorus line because he was really kind of messing around with the snare and maybe doing some uh, Tom hits every now and again, trying to fill them in here and there. And it was more like trying to time it just right too. So I admit, I kind of torture myself in a way trying to play it note for note too and probably go through so many takes just to get this part of it right so i did uh i did a rush cover and it was one of my first drum covers so there's the audio is just from the camera but it's the only cover you'll see that there is a, a big row of sheet music because i know <laughs> that if you don't play a rush song note for note some of those guys are so hardcore when it comes to Rush. They will call you out on everything and anything. And that's one of those bands where you, it, I feel like, yep, there's no there's no tiptoeing around. It's you play it the way that it was played, you know, because Neil Peart, he, he played it this way. You need to play it that way. Yeah. You know, sometimes I always thought it was more like out of respect too, especially if it was drummers who had tragically passed. <laughs> Yeah, as well. Yeah, that's that's why I did the cover. It was it was on one of his uh, it was on his anniversary of his passing, and uh, you know, and I just started my channel, so I did my uh, tribute to to Neil, and, uh, and that's why I felt like too. I also had to learn that and make sure I played it as close to, you know, um, accurate as I could. I was to say try to do like La Villa Stratiato, maybe note for note <laughs> too. That would be like, I don't know. I think that's a little outside my wheels. I probably do it for fun, but I think like, I mean, he's doing so many splashes here. And maybe throwing in some fills every now and again here and there. I think like this is way out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna just try and see what happens. But I don't even know wing and it's gonna be a good thing, to be honest. So Yeah. Yeah, they're one of the tougher bands to try to uh cover, uh in, in that sort of sense for me. Absolutely. And may Neil rest in peace too. He'll always be yes. a legend. So the professor. The professor. All the way. Yeah. But I guess, uh, speaking of Neil, I guess, would you say he's one of your biggest influences or do you have a good few others? My top influence, um, and you can see it in all my my style of playing, uh, Mike Portnoy. He is, he is who my go-to is. Um, like I said, when I joined that band in college and we were all music guys, uh, Dream Theater was my, uh, my buddy Brian's. It was like his absolute obsession. And then it became my obsession and it was... Dream Theater 24-7, Mike Portnoy is my hero. I have met that man probably at least 20 times now. Um, it's it's awesome. I've gone to a couple of his drum clinics. Uh, my mom's a huge, huge fan, so anytime that they were in town, we would go to both the Chicago and the Milwaukee showings, and we would see them back-to-back -back both weekends, and I absolutely uh, loved it. I was pretty crushed when he uh, you know, left and they switched to Mangini. Um, but I still follow Portnoy through like winery dogs and everything else. I'm just, a, I'm a huge Portnoy fan. He's probably my ultimate influence hero other than, uh, as crazy as it sounds, of course, uh, the drummer that played for my dad for the, uh, first 30 years of my life. He was my greatest influence because that's all I knew. I would sit in back of the stage and watch him play. Uh, his name's Dale Peterson. And, uh, you know, he just was my reason to keep going. And then when I got into college and I got serious about drumming, it was Mike Portnoy. I see. I guess, did you have any, like from the classic rock era with like Bill Ward and, uh, maybe, uh, John Bonham? Uh, John Bonham is a huge influence. I, uh, believe it or not, uh, Chicago. I, uh, am a huge fan of Chicago. Um, and so I'm a big fan of that. And then, uh, a big current one too, is I love sticks. Uh, Todd Zuckerman, um, is just, absolutely insane uh i even got the privilege he came to my tiny little town in janesville here and uh he did a drum clinic at our music store it was the coolest thing ever and it was crazy because there was only like 40 of us in this clinic and then you see him do all these world tours for thousands of people you know and and uh, to know that i got to meet him is uh, pretty awesome as he did a, a little drive through my 
you know, my little town. So that's pretty cool. Oh, that was so sweet. That'd be awesome to me. I guess, was that yeah. a good while back or was that kind of recent? Um, that was probably maybe only about seven years ago that he, uh, he came through. Yeah, it's probably, probably about that. Yeah. I feel bad for Sticks because it always seems like they play Renegade, which seems to be like really the only song you'll probably hear every now and again here and there. So, On the radio, yeah. Radio, yeah. And then uh, yeah. I think I did see him live the one time when they came to PNC Park. And uh, I think that was a song that really stood out, at least when everybody would start singing that, <laughs> trying to <laughs> sing it word for word, that sort of thing, too. So, so of course, you feel bad, too, because it's like that's really the only song you know from them, too. But you don't know about some of the other music they perhaps made, too, that seems like, oh, that's actually pretty good. This band's got like some good material yeah i mean uh if you ever watch his uh drum channel it's just and he, you watch him play and you listen to what him, you're doing he's doing and you're like this is sticks really this complex drumming that this man is just and he still plays traditional which is awesome i love that too he's a traditional grip drummer which is just cool to see still in a rock band especially I would say you're really kind of limited to like first off how where the beats per minute is for the song too, but then also what the people in front of you are playing, like the guitar player. So that's why I think Neil Peart had to really kind of make sure he timed everything right when trying to do fills. Think like Red Red Prochetta, for instance. So yeah, you're doing like all these sort of fills, and then like it's like it's still within the time frame too. So you want to make sure you're doing it right, and it has a nice feel to it too. So everything flows smoothly. To right put it frank, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, think, you know, I'd like to see, you know, a drummer like Neil Peart versus, let's say, like Bonham, like in concert, you know, I feel like Neil was always, it was always the exact same. Like the fills were always the same fill and it was perfectly written. But I, I never got a chance, obviously, to see like Bonham play or anything, but I'd love to have known, like, was it always off script and did he, you know, always do something different every time or was it always the same? And, you know, a lot of drummers, are, you know, they'll keep it close, but is it close? And, you know, that's where I, you know, like I said earlier, where do you find that happy medium?